It's uh, introducing Mr. Tariq Ali uh, is an onerous task. Uh, a public intellectual who has lived most of his life under the public eye and quite a bit of it under the watchful eyes of the FBI, CIA, and the MI6. <laughs> Much of Mr. Ali's work and opinions are well known, and it's not easy for me to give a spin on it. So I'll do the, the Wikipedia introduction first, and then see if I can build on it a little. Mr. Ali Kali, is a British Pakistani writer, journalist, and filmmaker. He is a member of the editorial committee of the New Left Review and regularly contributes to The Guardian, Counterpunch, which is a website founded by the late Alexander Coburn, and the London Review of Books. He's the author of several books. Actually, he's the author of more than 40 book length works uh, and, and numerous. Uh, articles and essays in, in journals, magazines, and other periodicals. But I'll mention only some of the works. Uh, his works include Pakistan Military Rule or People's Power, from an early work from 1970, Street Fighting Years, an autobiography of the 60s. It's originally published in 1987, and the new edition was issued in 2005. Can Pakistan Survive the Death of a State? Pirates of the Caribbean, Axis of Hope, Conversations with Edward Said, Bush in Babylon, A Clash of Fundamentalisms, <clears throat> playing on the Clash of Civilizations of Samuel Huntington, Clash of Fundamentalisms, Crusades, Jihads, and Modernity, A Banker for All Seasons, The Duel, The Obama Syndrome, and most recently on History, conversations with Oliver Stone, Oliver Stone, the filmmaker who recently also did a film called The Unwritten uh, History of uh, the United States. He's also the author of more than eight works of fiction and eight plays by my count. His father was a journalist and mother an activist. Both his parents had broken with his family's conventions in politics especially his father when he was a student adopting communism and atheism. Mr. Ali grew up as an atheist, as did many of his friends, which was not uncommon in those days. Already in his teen years, he had begun taking part in demonstrations in opposition to the military dictatorship in Pakistan. And when it became obvious that he might be in danger, his parents sent him to England at Exeter College in Oxford. He studied philosophy, politics, and economics. And he was elected president of the Oxford Union in 1965. And when he was president, I think it was during his presidency that he met, he met Malcolm X. However, it was as a staunch opponent of the Vietnam War that he came into his own as a public figure of the left. During this time, he debated Henry Kissinger, testified at the Russell Tribunal, and became a trenchant critic of American foreign policy. He was also a vigorous op opponent of American relations with Pakistan that tended to back military dictatorship over democracy. Mr. Ali's life as an intellectual and activist coincides with the social and political ferment of the 1960s, of which he was an indivisible part. His 1987 book, Street Fighting Years, an autobiography of the 60s, is an account of his formative years as a young radical. That story takes us from Paris to Prague to Hanoi <coughs> to, and Bolivia, encountering along the way Malcolm X, Bertrand Russell, Marlon Brando, Mick Jagger, and Reggie Debray, who was then imprisoned in Bolivia. His book, Bush in Babylon, criticizes the 2003 invasion of Iraq by George W. Bush. It's a history of numerous Western interventions and occupations and the depiction of a complex civilization that the West has failed to grasp. His previous book, Clash of Fundamentalism, was occasioned by the September 11 attack and its American response and tells the history of Islam from its foundations. Mr. Ali has remained a critic of modern neoliberal economics and was present at the 2005 World Social Forum in Porto Alegre in Brazil. His Banker for All Seasons on the ignominious fall and demise of the Bank of Credit and Commerce International, 
with the appropriate acronym BCCI, is an account of an organization populated by smooth operators, greedy geniuses, brutal henchmen, all under the imprimatur of high government officials across the globe that went down amidst a flurry of criminal activity, money laundering, smuggling, covered sales, of nuclear technology, and murder. Stalley counts among his friends Mick Jagger and the Rolling Stones and John Lennon and Yoko Ono. This is the abbreviated version uh, of introduction to a life of infinite variety. Now I would like to <clears throat> ever so briefly be present to us enough to move from introduction to what makes Tariq Ali uniquely Tariq Ali. How do we understand a public intellectual whose passions and performances have paralleled the social, political, and intellectual life of, a second, of the second half of last century as either participant or antagonist? To put it succinctly, what is left? And needless to say, the answer comes from Mr. Ali's own writings and the preoccupations he returns to repeatedly. One of these is the social, political, and cultural churning of the 60s. In an article in The Guardian in May of this year, 1963, from Stones to Dr. Strangelove, a year of social and cultural upheaval, <clears throat> Mr. Ali looked at the year that defined the modern era and recalled the extraordinary collision of politics, culture, and social upheaval that he witnessed as a student. It was a year that Mr. Ali arrived in London Within a month, Kennedy had been assassinated. It was a decade of hope and hope betrayed. The election of the young president and the hope it represented was undermined by the Bay of Pigs. The Cuban Missile Crisis prompted the campaign for nuclear disarmament. It was a decade of racist lynchings answered at once by the fiery Malcolm X and the gentler Martin Luther King Jr. Young people took, took sides, Beatles or the Rolling Stones, Two American filmmakers who emigrated to Britain, Richard Lester and Stanley Kubrick, savagely lampooned America. Then there were the new wave films of Godard in particular. This is the environment where you find Mr. Ali most at home. The music and the bands of the 1960s appear again and again in his writings. The second article I would like to invoke is a piece Ms. Raleigh wrote in The Guardian on the passing of the great sitar which also Pandit Ravi Shankar. Ms. Raleigh has no patience with a cant that associates Ravi Shankar's music with hippies, drugs, and the Beatles. He quickly dismisses these associations, claiming rightly that they learned little from him, and his influence on pop music was little, if any. In a moving tribute that pays as much homage to Panditji as it does to the Raga-based music of the Indian subcontinent, dominated by melody and rhythm, Mr. Ali says this of the Sri Ravi Shankar. Quote, he knew that the innate knowledge of South Asian music lovers could not be easily reproduced elsewhere. An all-night open-air concert in lush surroundings on a summer night in Lahore or Delhi, Trivandrum or Dhaka, with the voice of divas competing with the instruments and reaching a crescendo as the dawn light intrudes and they combine for a finale has no equivalent in the West. Here, the constraints of time and money determine the length of a concert." Unquote. And the homage concludes thus, quote, when I was introduced to, and this is this Mr. Riley speaking, when I was introduced to Ravi Shankar in London after a concert in the early 60s, he looked at me and asked, well, not the same as in our part of the world, was the only reply I, I could muster. He laughed a deep throaty laugh. That it will never be. In his descriptions of Istanbul streets with arcades and Belle Epoque apartments disfigured by shops and malls, we come across the same sense of loss. So in a world of surveillance states and drone assassins, the 60s intellectual must ask, what is left of the left? or who is left. I know Mr. Ali's subject today is not meant to address this, but I hope he would give some thought to these questions in his future talks and writings. We welcome Mr. Ali. I'm very happy to be here.
more happy when I heard how this institution um, had been set up. And uh, Shashi Kumar explained to me as we were traveling in Kerala over the last few days what its aims were. So I can say a little more, but what a wonderful thing it is that in these bad times, institutes like this set up and students are being taught what journalism is and what journalism should be and what journalism once was. Now the subject for the title basically speaks for itself. But we have to understand what has changed and what remains necessary in the flow of information in many, many continents and many large countries of the world. The basic point I think which all of you know is that without a free flow of information, there can be no serious democracy or democratic functioning in a country. So when political pressures are put on journalism, as is increasingly the case in the Western world, then we have to see that as a dangerous development because it threatens and hollows out democracy itself. And I will return to that in a while. But let me just first speak briefly about what journalism was for the bulk of the 20th century. The journalism we saw in many parts of the world, primarily the Western world, and then later on after the old colonies became independent in the newly independent countries themselves, was marked by the following desire to show how superior their journalism was. And the reason for this in the West was very obvious. It was the Cold War. For various reasons, uh, which I have discussed in many um, essays, etc., the development of the Soviet Union led to the creation of a single party state the total monopoly of information by that state and the inability of its citizens to ask questions which needed to be asked for that state to develop further. And this model of the left was of course heavily attacked in the West and the main uh, 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 accusation used to be that there is no free press. And against that, we couldn't argue that there was. And it's by free, I don't mean a press that is owned by huge corporations. I mean a press which coexists with other newspapers which do not share the same opinion. And you know, in one of uh, Lenin's more utopian works, State and Revolution, I think it is, I may be wrong, when they're thinking about what, how that society would develop, he talks that any group of citizens who collect 100,000 signatures should be allowed to publish their own newspapers, which should be printed without question by the state corporation, printing corporation. So it's not that they were unaware of what was needed. It, what started out of necessity later was then paraded as a virtue. And this the West attacked. And they attacked it very savagely, and they attacked it very cleverly. And they did so by making space available on their television screens, on their radios before that, on their, in their newspapers, to dissident, diverse voices. If you look, for instance, at the British media during the 50s, early 60s even, later, people were writing, communist intellectuals, historians, Christopher Hill, Eric Hobsbawm, others like them were being broadcast on radio on important subjects, not just academic themes, that essays were being published in the BBC magazine, The Listener, and this was very deliberate. It was the effects were good because it educated a new layer of uh, young people at universities. But the aim was very clear to show we are superior to you. And if you notice the language that was used in the first 
during the years of the Cold War, especially the first uh, 50 or 60 years of it, the word capitalism was barely used. It was used by people like me. It was used by people on the left. It was never a word that was acknowledged and used by those who defended the capitalist system because they, even they felt there was something wrong with it. So instead of capitalism, the word they would use was freedom. Freedom and democracy. Never or very rarely, if ever, was capitalism used. That became something much more common in the late 80s and 90s of the last century. And now, of course, it's uh, uh, everywhere. But in those days, it wasn't used. And freedom and democracy were words used because they knew that these are the words which would hurt the, their enemies in the Cold War and which it was very, would be very difficult for serious leftists to defend. And so that was the period, if you like, the Cold War period, where the Western media was at its peak in terms of what it published and what it showed. During the Vietnam War, you had some of the most critical reporting published in the New York Times, not just the print media. I can still remember very vividly watching, switching on television to watch the news, because in those days one used to watch it, because there was often real news on there. <clears throat> and you switched on the television to watch the news, and, they say, and there was a CBS correspondent, Molly Safer, reporting from the battlefields in Vietnam, showing American soldiers targeting a Vietnamese village uh, 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 with flames, burning the village, women and children rushing out of their small huts on fire, and Molly Safer's cameras recording this and his voice saying, this is how we are defending freedom and democracy. Unthinkable today. But they did it, precisely because they were trapped partially by their own ideology that they had to do it, and partially because no one had yet decided that this was not the way to report a war. And war reporting in particular has a long tradition of some honorable journalists in the Western world, going back to the Crimean War, who sent dispatches to their newspapers, which were very beautifully and impartially written, making no claims to support one side in particular, not even the British side. But when you read them, you got a very clear picture of what was going on. And this even applied to the Boer War, when the newspapers themselves were under regular censorship. So all that was escalated and enlarged during the Cold War. And it was not difficult in those days to, uh, to say things uh, which they didn't like which the media of that time didn't like. I remember at a high point in 1968, all the student leaders of Europe who had participated in the uprisings of that year were invited by the BBC, uh, including myself, and said, we're going to have a one-hour interview with you people. So I was acting as their trade union representatives of these students and I was with the BBC and I said, uh, we will only do this on condition that the program goes out live. We are not going to do it if you edit the program, because you can do anything to it, so you will film us for just as long as the program is going out live. So they agreed, much to our astonishment. We wouldn't have gone on. And the program went out, and at the end of the program, uh, we all stood up and sang the International with clenched fists, which was broadcast by the BBC, the first and last time they have ever done that. Uh, but it, it, shows, it shows, you know, how the political situation, the conjuncture, the global crisis influences uh, the media in particular times. If, if you look at many other things that happened in that time, I mean, the European press, in particular the French daily Le Monde, had some of the most high-powered journalists writing brilliant analyses from the Middle East, from Vietnam, from South America. You go back and look at their essays, 
they still stand up as very fine pieces of uh, writing. Television, radio news was, you know, compared to today, you wouldn't be able to recognize it. People say, sometimes when I'm addressing journalist classes or students in British universities, I show them some clips from what was on television even in the 80s, and they are shocked. They say, my God, that was actually on television? And I said, yeah, it was on television. And it was possible to put this stuff out, and don't ever forget that, because times might change again, and you then, the new generations, will be needed to do that. So it's important not to forget the history. Not to forget the history of uh, uh, journalism and its development. Now, you always, talking about trivia, you always had an element of trivia in the broad media. But there were specialist magazines based in Los Angeles and uh, Mumbai, which catered to that. Film magazines, you know, which had nothing but photographs of uh, stars and their romances and their divorces and how many children they had and other important things like that. <laughs> which was fine. You know, you can have a specialist magazine. Why not? And then people know who are interested, they will go and buy that magazine and read whatever they want to read. The same thing with sports, specialist magazines, some of them still exist. <clears throat> but when all this began to infiltrate the mainstream press, it created a new culture within the media, a culture which told people that your models have to be celebrities. Whether it's film stars, whether it's models who model clothes, uh, whether it's sporting stars, whether it's members of uh, uh, living or extinct royal families, all this became a central feature of reporting as soon, almost as soon as the Cold War came to an end. And even a newspaper which I respect very much and which I write for, The Guardian, its Delhi correspondent told me I can't write anymore because the instructions we're getting from London are don't be too serious, cover more trivial everyday stories. Murders, for instance. Well, if you want to cover murders in any part of the world, you can have Murder Inc. as a special newspaper and just cover them. But the, so he was shocked, actually. And then increasingly, as globalization began in earnest, capital, capital moved freely across the world. But somehow the culture, the political culture, and the media culture became much more provincialized. So the, imp the effect of globalization was, in reality, to provincialize most of these newspapers. They were no longer sending serious reports. They were publishing, as even The Guardian had to admit, was you know, reports of general human interest, they call it, human interest reports. Nothing serious. Don't trouble our readers too much. Don't, they, don't, they shouldn't have to think too hard. Let their brain cells begin to disappear. And that is what happened. I mean, I say this about The Guardian, a paper I love very much and which I write for and which is one of the only serious newspapers left now in Europe, not just in Britain, but in Europe and America. And as a footnote, I will tell you that when 9-11 took place, the following week, I think a million, between a million and two million Americans just went hit The Guardian website because they didn't trust their own press. And this website collapsed at one point because they were not prepared for this rush. And now, of course, it is one of the free and, uh, freest and best websites of the uh, Western media in the world. Uh, uh, people go to it and they carry on investigative journalism, which was also something that had uh, begun to disappear. Don't actually investigate. So newspapers became the relayers of reports that other people had provided. <coughs> 
sometimes other journalists and sometimes governments. And the decline that set in immediately after the Cold War was very sharp. So human interest stories and celebrities. And the effect of this concentration on celebrities you saw in a very clear way when, you know, I must say as someone who lives in London, I was taken aback because I was not prepared by it, that when Princess Diana died, I mean, obviously it was a sad thing. I mean, it would be sad if any young woman with two children died, but she was not anyone. And the hysteria that grew up after that death was quite astonishing. And none of these people knew her, but she was always in some newspaper every single day since she became the wife of, uh, what is he called, Charles Windsor. And that is how it was. And people felt they'd lost someone very dear to them. And some foolish journalist said, this is the end of the monarchy. And I said, for God's sake, it's the strengthening of the monarchy. When 100,000 people gather in Hyde Park and sing, God save the queen, doesn't indicate to me a weakening of that particular ideological grip in relation to monarchism. So I, I talk about her because I experienced this where people didn't want to hear any criticism at all, either of her, which no one was making, but what is there to say? Poor thing, she died. But of the way in which the media covered it, there is a lot of criticism to be made. It was as if you know some sort of catastrophic event had taken place, worse than a tsunami, worse than an earthquake, which we were all suffering from. And. Uh, I predicted at the time that it wouldn't last. I said it's like froth. It will come and within a few years there'll be no memorials, nothing, and that's exactly what happened. Exactly what happened. So this sudden emotional outpouring in the case of Diana also then transferred in a strange way to fighting wars. The production of images, here television was played a, a key role that once the West decided to go to war against a country, immediately television coverage of that particular country reached saturation point. And the same images were shown again and again and again. When the NATO decided to attack Yugoslavia, the images we saw were images of Kosovan refugees boarding trains to get out of the way. Fine. But the way they were shot and they, the way they were projected and the uh, voiceover that went with them said this reminds us of what happened in the Second World War under the Third Reich. You know, what happened in Kosovo was of course not good, but the maximum number of people killed, and this has now been attested by the United Nations, was 1,600, which is not a good thing, okay? But to compare this to the atrocities of the Third Reich, just staggering. And basically, they wanted to destroy Yugoslavia. The IMF had already started the process, not allowing the Yugoslav army to be paid for a whole year. The state began to crack up. Ethnic div uh, divisions were encouraged. And then they went in to finish the job with NATO bombers. And uh, uh, the, the media had built this up. And so it's, it's, as if only, it's as if the only good war they have known is the Second World War. And so Hitler's emerge whenever they are necessary in different parts of the world. And this goes actually even you know, at the height of the Cold War in 1956, when uh, Gemal Abdel Nasser, a nationalist, very popular leader of Egypt, was described by the British Prime Minister as the Hitler on the Nile. It didn't have any effect. Half the 